So in standing side bend, I was recently doing a video, I was recording some um, video clips from my latest video. This is the, the push, I guess you'd call it, or the sales pitch. I was doing a set of videos from my latest set of downloadable videos called Vectored Yoga Poses. And what I noticed is that on one side doing side bend, my belly was all right. But on the other side, I noticed, and I might have to insert some pictures here so you can see it clearly, it's like my lower belly, one side of my lower belly was not active. And I've left, I've noticed this for a while, and I've pretty much left it alone. Um, I had other priorities, sorting out knees and feet and hips and other stuff. And I wasn't quite sure how to approach it. But then, um, after watching my latest, reviewing my latest videos, there's a link in the description box. After reviewing my latest videos, I decided to play around with to see if I could make this, this deadness in the, the left side of my belly disappear. And one, one reason that I was inspired to do it was that in while doing side bend, I actually had some knee discomfort. And so what I my normal suggestion for knee discomfort in standing side bend is to adjust shin rotation. So adjust one shin adjust the other shin and that often for me makes the knee pain go away and I notice I only have knee pain on one side so it may have been related to that uh, belly thing I was talking about. So anyway what I figured in order to get this side of the belly to suck in is I actually had to pull up on the iguinal ligament and the iguinal ligament attaches to the ASIC, the point of the hip bone to the pubic bone. It's the crease that divides your thigh from your belly. Now I first learned about this muscle when I was looking at the transverse abdominis. There's a band of transverse abdominis fibers which attaches to the ASICs but also to the, to the hip bones, front of the hip bones, but also to the outer portion, let's just say, but, but also to the inguinal ligaments. So you could use this lower band of the transverse abdominis to pull in on the A6, pull in on the inguinal ligaments. So pulling the A6 in will pull the sitting bones out and that will cause a change in the SI joints. And that action actually causes the tailbone to move back. So the top of the sacrum moves in along with the A6. So it closes the top of the pelvis. And, um, so that, that was one reason for looking at the inguinal ligament. Now I didn't really pay a lot of attention. For me it was just interesting to learn that I could use the lower band of the transverse abdominis to pull in on those ligaments. Meanwhile the mid band could be used here, the upper band here, but that's getting away from it. But using the lower transverse abdominis, I found it was slightly more effective to pull on the A6 inwards on the A6, but not so much on the inguinal ligament. And you may find if you play with lower transverse abdominis, you get some tension in the pelvic floor area. So coming back to the external obliques and my belly problem, what I decided to do was to create an upward pull or an upward and inward pull on the iguinal ligament. So my first experiment was solely focused on the pull, creating a pull, sort of like an upwards and inwards pull on the iguinal ligament while doing side bend, I noticed it made a difference or it seemed to make a difference. It took a little bit of practice. And then, so then the goal was to figure out, okay, why, why does pulling up on the inguinal ligament have an effect, it seemed to have effect because it, it also made my knee not hurt. I was able to do side bend and I didn't even have to adjust uh, for shin rotation. So I spent a couple of days, um, I actually experimented with creating an upward pull on both inguinal ligaments. And what I figured out with, there's, um, if you read Anatomy Trains, there's a spiral line where the opposite external oblique attaches to the, where one side of the external oblique attaches to the opposite internal oblique to create a, um, yeah, so external oblique, internal oblique creates a cross link across the side of the body. And playing around with it, I decided it wasn't that that I was looking at. Instead, it was actually the same side 
uh, re um, external oblique which I was using to create an upward pull on the inguinal ligament and so what happens is I get a little bit of popping out excuse me so what happens there is I get a little bit of popping out there the side so right about here the external obliques here aren't activating it's more just along here so from these ribs down to the inguinal ligament so it's almost like the external obliques when I pull up on the inguinal ligament it's like the external obliques these external obliques not the whole set but just the ones that attach to the say to these ribs which would be rib probably eight nine possibly ten the external obliques which are rib, rib which originate from those ribs and attach so whichever fibers of the external oblique attach to the uh, inguinal ligament, they create an upward pull on the inguinal ligament and they act more or less like the rectus abdominis with the, with the proviso that where the rectus abdominis just pulls up on the pubic bone, these muscles pull up on the inguinal ligament and possibly via the inguinal ligament create an upward pull both on the A6 and the pubic bone together. So one way, so just for a moment, I'll step into why I'm in, so interested in this uh, rectus abdominis inguinal ligament connection. Like I said earlier, what I did, when I played around with keeping that active, I found doing bridge pose and wheel pose, and those wheel pose in particular is a pose which I am not that good at. I, my back bends really uh, are very limited. But I've been practicing back bending wheel pose regularly, you know, with a specific focus for the last month or so. And what I found was when I engaged, when I pulled up, created an uh, upper pull on my inguinal ligaments, wheel pose was easier. And it might have been a bunch of other factors also contributed, but all of a sudden wheel pose felt easier. But doing front to back splits, I always find left leg back front splits, I'm always, it's tighter. It seems to be because of the back leg, not the front leg, that when I do left leg forward splits. So I tried the same action, creating an upper pull on the inguinal ligament in splits. And while my left side split wasn't, uh, still wasn't as good as my right side split, it was a lot closer to my hips being right on the ground than it had been before. And it wasn't, and there wasn't a sense that I was pushing or forcing myself into it. All I was doing was pulling up on the inguinal ligament, doing other actions as well. Um, other actions which I've been practicing over the course of the last few years have also contributed, but it seemed like this was an important piece of the puzzle which allowed me to go deeper into left side back splits. Um, left, uh, left leg back, front to back splits. And another pose, Virasana, you know, when you kneel with your feet out to the side, Again, there are lots of other actions that I do in that, in particular playing with the long hip muscles, which I've talked about in previous videos. But here again, creating an upward pull on the inguinal ligaments seemed to make Virasana a lot more comfortable. And when I did one-sided Virasana, say with only one leg, that's the first time I've laid back comfortably in a long time, bearing in mind that I've been dealing with knee issues, trying to, to help them. But this activation seemed to help. A lot. So the big question for me is why is that? What's the importance of creating an upward pull on the inguinal ligament of activating the external obliques? And it's not like it's your know, normal description of the external obliques. They, when used together, they bend your spine forward. On one side, it can be used in a side bend. It's something a little bit more deeper than that. And I think it's. It's a way of stabilizing the hip bone, and it also can affect the SI joint on the same side. So if you look at the SI joints, it relates strongly to the hip bone. The hip bone is one half of one of the SI joints. So two SI joints, they connect the sacrum to the two hip bones. And generally, when you look at the pelvic floor, transverse abdominis, even the sacral multifidus, all those muscles can work, uh, work together to help change the shape of the pelvis via the SI joints. 
transverse abdominis can pull the A6 in to, to tilt the sacrum, to nod the sacrum forwards relative to the hip bones. The pelvic floor muscles can pull the sitting bones inwards to nod the sacrum backwards relative to the hip bones. And at the same time, as the sacrum nods forwards or backwards, it causes the hip bones to either, the hip bones to hinge around the pubic bone and sacrum. So if this is the pubic bone, this is the sacrum, and this is the hip bones, um, the hip bones move relative to each other, changing the shape of the pelvis. Now, when you use transverse abdominis, pelvic floor, and the multifidus, you're more than likely affecting both SI joints at the same time. One of the things I've been looking at is single-sided SI joint activation or stabilization, and this may be part of, um, part of or one way that the body uses to stabilize uh, the same side SI joint. So by pulling up by pulling up on the inguinal ligament, you're actually pulling, creating a slightly inwards pull on this, as well as an upward pull on the pubic bone. So the inward pull on the ASIC will cause the sitting bone on that side to spread apart. And that will, on this side anyway, it will nod the, do the equivalent of nodding the sacrum forwards. So, so it may be a way of, you know, if you spread the sitting bone away from the, the sacrum, that can actually add tension to the sacral tuberous ligament, which makes it easier to use either the butt muscle or the hamstrings or both. Now, another thing, so, so it may be a way of stabilizing the SI joint and the hip bone. And with those two stabilized relative to each other, what that may mean is that, um, you know, and of course it's also stabilizing the hip bone relative to the rib cage, creating sort of like an upward pull there. And that may make it easier, say for example, for the sartorius, it may give a stable foundation for the sartorius, rectus femoris, tensor fascia, lati, all of those cross to the knee joint. So it's something like this. It may give those muscles a little bit of extra stability. So that's, that's sort of one theory on why pulling up on the inguinal ligament might be helpful. The iliacus attaches to the hip bone, passes under the inguinal ligament to attach along with the psoas and the pectineus to the top of the inner thigh towards the back. So if you're creating an upward pull on the inguinal ligament, which in turn creates an upward pull on the ASIC, if that muscle, if it's relaxed, that muscle, unless you've stabilized the foot and the thigh, um, the iliacus won't have a stable foundation to work on the hip joint. However, if you create an upward point pull on the ASIC and the inguinal ligament via the external obliques, you may be creating a stable foundation, you may be stabilizing the hip bone so that the iliacus can then work effectively on the thigh bone. And even though the iliacus is generally a hip flexor, what it may be doing, say in the leg back position, is helping to keep the hip joint, so helping the front of the hip joint from perhaps bursting open. It might be its function there, it might not be so much uh, um, in resisting extension as it is in keeping the hip joint or helping to keep the hip joint intact balance and tension throughout the hip joint so that your brain gets a signal, ah, oh, iliacus is activating, that means it's okay for me to let the thigh go further back into extension maybe. And that might be one reason why it's helpful in um, Virasana or Supta Virasana in particular lying back. That's why it also may be helpful in wheel pose and or bridge pose because it helps protect the hip joint when it is being extended, i.e. bent backwards. That's a guess on my part or, or a possibility of theory if you like. It bears a little bit more investigation, but more important, I guess the more important thing is if activating or pulling up 
on the one or both inguinal ligaments using the external obliques makes it easier to do certain poses without causing pain, then use it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Namaste. Remember to check out the links in the description box for my latest uh, videos, in particular vectored yoga poses, but also uh, videos on muscle control, learning to feel and control your muscles for better body control, but also better body awareness or proprioception. Thank you very much again. Namaste.